Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you guys with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Okay, happy Monday, everybody. First up, my apologies in advance if my voice sounds a little bit off today.、Uh, hopefully,、uh, should be back to normal within the next few days. Also, a big thank you to everyone for your kind words. Uh, of support from the last video, much appreciated. One of the wild cards for the Chinese economy and East Asian geopolitics over the medium term is the slowly escalating technology war between the United States and the People's Republic of China. Over the last several days, we have seen several developments on this front, and for most of today's video, we will be examining these. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to hit that like button. And for the 50% of viewers who are currently not subscribed, if you do get some value from these types of videos, maybe consider subscribing, hit the bell notification, and you'll have these episodes as soon as they're released. You'll be on top of the most up-to-date analysis on China. The big news is that late. Uh, last week, the U.S. government added 36 Chinese companies to a trade blacklist, including Yangtze Memory Technologies Co., YMTC, Shanghai Microelectronics Equipment Group Co., and dozens of other Chinese technology companies. Peng Xinwei IC Manufacturing Co. (PXW), a chip business suspected to be connected to Huawei Technologies, was also on the blacklist. Others affected included Cambricon, a domestic leader in chip design, driving Chinese semiconductor and AI development. Back in September, the CEO of the company disclosed that it is developing three autonomous driving chips spanning L2 through L4 functions. Indeed, this technology war could seriously under Mind domestic efforts at developing autonomous vehicles, efforts which Beijing, as we have seen, has already pumped billions of dollars worth of subsidies into. Another firm is Tiandi, T I A N D Y, a surveillance camera and facial recognition software company. Washington also applied the foreign direct product rule to 21 entities, meaning non-American companies will be prohibited from exporting products that contain a specified amount of U.S. technology to the Chinese groups. However, it is the blacklisting of YMTC, China's top flash memory maker, which is of most significance. A development that may have come as a surprise to some in the industry. Quote, "Wow, did Apple misjudge the mood in Washington when it invested so much into helping YMTC improve so that it could be certified as a low-cost iPhone supplier?" End quote. This、uh, blacklisting will further disrupt the embattled firm, as the rules require tools capable of producing 128 layer NAD flash chips to be approved for export. Quote, Adding YMTC to the entry list will not bring down its current production completely, but it will hinder production and product development due to restricted access to U.S. suppliers. End quote. Another notable hit for China is the blacklisting of Shanghai Microelectronics Equipment Group Co. or SMEE. Quote, Having SMEE on the entry list is a major blow for China's chip sector. It's the one company that Beijing saw as having potential to produce advanced chip-making machines, which is essential for China to be a competitive force in the global semiconductor ecosystem. Those hopes are now greatly diminished, if not dashed altogether. End quote. Arm, A R M, the Cambridge, England-based semiconductor and software design company owned by Japanese tech investor SoftBank, last week announced that it has concluded that the U.S. and U.K. would not approve the sale of its latest NeoVerse 5 series to Chinese customers like Alibaba's T Head. Because the performance was too high, the Financial Times, also UK-based, Japanese-owned, writes, "Quote: It is the first known time that Arm has decided it could not export its most cutting-edge designs to China." End quote. Over the weekend, we learned too that a subsidiary of Taiwan's Foxconn will dispose of its indirect minority stake in China's state-backed semiconductor giant Tsinghua Uni Group. Quote, "The latest sign that Beijing's chip industry is becoming increasingly isolated from the rest of the world." End quote. In the words of one Bloomberg intelligence analyst, the iPhone maker said in a statement that it decided to sell the stake quote, to avoid uncertainty because the investment still cannot be finalized. End quote. 
We remember that the would-be investment, though small, had raised eyebrows in Taipei, as Foxconn was required to inform the government in advance of such an investment. Taiwan's Ministry of Economic Affairs said in a statement on Saturday that it will still fine Foxconn for this conduct. Meanwhile, on the financial side, there are also unconfirmed reports that the White House has drafted a plan to keep American money out of sensitive Chinese technology companies, but that this plan is still up in the air as Treasury officials and U.S. big business interests have been advocating to narrow its scope. On this theme, too, there is also a U.S. Senate bill which would, quote, ban U.S. companies from participating in significant transactions with foreign firms that produce 5G technology and engage in industrial espionage, end quote. It's believed that the bill will effectively halt Huawei's access to the U.S. financial system. Okay, so that is a lot from the U.S. side. So how is China responding to this U.S. tightening of technology, specifically semiconductor controls? Well, it's first important to note that China has not been knocked out of the game. It does have options, but these options are limited and, in many cases, suboptimal. Quote, China's lack of good options is precisely why the U.S. is striking hard and fast now with export controls. End quote. China's counterattack strategy is multifaceted. We've already covered Beijing's preparations for a 1 trillion yuan, 140 billion US dollar aid package for its semiconductor industry. However, as one senior fellow at the Washington based Center for Strategic and International Studies explains, China's strategy is more international than one might expect. Quote, so the negotiations China is having right now is that they are going to governments like Japan, the Netherlands, and to the companies in these countries and saying, if you start making products that the US currently has a monopoly on, we will give you a boatload of money. And it's sort of like, and this is not a perfect analogy, but if you want to make an airplane and the United States makes the wheels and the avionics, but the Dutch make the engines and the Japanese make the structures, well, maybe Japan doesn't make landing gear today, but they're way, way closer to being able to make landing gear than China is. Right now, it's a top US diplomatic priority that these export controls, which are currently unilateral, become multilateral. And that's most urgent in the case of the Netherlands and Japan, who have an extremely high degree of sophistication in semiconductor equipment and could start producing equipment that's analogous to what the United States currently produces and has a monopoly on in a matter of years. End quote. We have already seen both the Japanese and Nederland governments have committed in principle to work with the United States government multilaterally with the restrictions. Unsurprisingly, though, companies themselves, operating in highly competitive environments, are not too pleased. The CEO of Dutch chip equipment maker ASML, in an interview with a Dutch newspaper, expressed, quote, ASML has already sacrificed. End quote, expressing that the government has already restricted his firm from exporting its most advanced lithography machines to China since 2019, which, quote, benefited U.S. companies selling alternative technology, end quote. Last week, we already heard from an executive of Japan's Tokyo Electron Limited, who questioned the wisdom of the U.S. restrictions, expressing that they will do little to hold back Chinese ambitions over the medium to long term. Of course, these executives, both Dutch and Japanese, have fiduciary duties to shareholders to keep selling to the massive Chinese market. So their views, publicly at least, are of course somewhat biased. Also, unsurprisingly, Beijing is rhetorically pushing back too, with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs spokesperson Wang Wenbin expressing on Friday, quote, We urge the U.S. to stop overstretching the concept of national security, stop taking discriminatory and unfair measures against specific Chinese companies, and stop politicizing and weaponizing economic and trade issues. End quote. Adding that the U.S. measures are, quote, detrimental to market rules and the international trade order, and gravely threatens the stability of the global industrial and supply chains. End quote. Of course, as we have discussed before, there are more than a few countries in Asia and beyond that in recent years could perhaps also accuse the PRC of overstretching the concept of national security and weaponizing economic and trade issues, as Mr. Wang puts it.
Okay, that is today's episode of China Update. Once again, my apologies for the voice. For anyone who wants to go the extra mile and help keep China Update sustainable, Patreon and Buy Me a Coffee links are in the description below. This is a big help for the channel. Thank you so much, everybody, for the ongoing support. Thank you, everybody, for watching today's episode. I hope you have a wonderful day, and I'll see you all tomorrow.